Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, and Happy New Year. You know, with New Year's comes often resolutions. So myself and the Marian Fathers and everybody here at EWTN hope that you too, in this new year, can turn to a life of virtue and try as best we can to leave behind the vices. That's why a few weeks ago we began a new seven-part series on the seven deadly sins, where we covered the sins of pride and envy already, and the corresponding virtues to overcome them. This week, we're going to discuss the sin of gluttony, which is also applicable during the holidays, which is often associated with eating or drinking too much. But few know this sin goes much deeper. The sin of gluttony is not one that is given much notice today, and yet it is, along with lust, one of the most pervasive sins in our Western culture. Gluttony is always wanting more. Now, it's different from greed, which we'll discuss on a later show. It is feeling that we are not filled. It is um, filling not only our stomachs, but our entire lives with excess and still wanting more. It causes us to form idols out of things we think we need and fills our lives and souls with distractions. You know, think shopping or eating as a cure for sadness, for example. What we actually need has been replaced, if you will, by what we think we need, uh, what we think we want. You know, only God can fill our voids. Uh, but we try to fill them with everything else. We eat when we are not even hungry. We pile our closets full of clothes we never wear and collect items we'll never use again. Sound familiar? Well, the cure for such gluttony is temperance or moderation. You know, we should eat to live, not live to eat. And this can be extended to all other material things in our life. You know, a good example is drinking. There is an obvious difference between enjoying a drink and getting drunk. But Father, food and alcohol are not sinful. Jesus ate and drank. Yes, but it can be problematic because overuse becomes a love of pleasure. And this engenders many other passions in us. Um, in other words, if we indulge our bodies in the flesh, in such ways, we will find that the sins of lust and greed, for example, will not be far behind. For those, too, are indulgences of the flesh. Now, we are not, obviously, to starve ourselves or to never enjoy life in any way. No, that's not what we're saying. But overindulgence in even the little things can cause us to make all kinds of idols of our lives that can distract us from God and lead us into sin. Therefore, we must put the flesh under the control of the Spirit. The Bible tells us so. And one great way to do this is the practice of fasting, which none of us want to do on the holidays. But in the new year, we'll think about it. So fasting not only um, means giving up certain foods, but also giving up many other things we love. Uh, for the love of Christ, and in order to maintain our gaze solely on Him. Remember, sin is simply taking our eyes off of the Creator and putting it on the creature or the created thing. You know, doing this too much becomes the root of many problems, including breaking the first commandment um, and making food or drink, uh, or ultimately ourselves, God. We become God. Our stomach becomes God. So at the same time, we don't want to fall into sin of Manichaeism, though. You know, this is heresy, which says that everything of the flesh in the world is evil. No, not true. One of the foundational or fundamental Christian beliefs is that the created world is good. This is the first chapter of Genesis. It is sin that has defiled it. However, this does not mean that created things could not be misused, uh, used immoderately, or even abused. They can be. 
And in the case of addiction, for example, a person has developed, uh, in this case, an unhealthy dependency on some created thing or activity, which can be sinful because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we have the obligation to take care of them. However, since addiction limits one's freedom, one may not actually be fully culpable. What does that mean, fully responsible in those cases? But in any event, we are required to practice temperance. It's a matter of justice, actually, because the self-care and concern for others is pleasing to God. You know, God put people and things under our care. And if we cannot properly take care of them because of an addiction or some preoccupation with something else, we are failing in our God-given mission. You know, substance abuse is of particular concern, especially now with fentanyl and all this opioids. It's, it's very sad, and we have to be careful um, because it's a serious, it seriously affects us as individuals, families, and the whole society. You know, the choice to endanger uh, oneself or others through the use of drugs or alcohol can be gravely sinful, according to Catechism 2290. So, again, be careful not to get into these things too deep uh, or at all, because then it is not possible to simply decide not to use them. Well, I'll stop when I want to. No. With addiction, one's brain is altered to need the substance. Addictions confuse uh, a person's mind and ability to make decisions. You know, once addiction develops in a person, the person is no longer free. They don't have freedom and can find themselves making choices contrary to their health and the good of one's relationships and neighbors. That's why with addiction, one must acknowledge that they cannot get better on their own. They need help. And that's why recovery programs can even assist somebody in rediscovering their faith, which is the best way to true healing. Now, while not always possible, okay, our goal is to not let ourselves fall into this condition in the first place. Again, that is why we need temperance. As the Catechism defines it, Temperance is the virtue that disposes us to avoid every kind of excess. Basically, it moderates the attraction of fleshly pleasures that the Bible warns about and provides balance in the use of created things that God gives us. Basically, it ensure, ensures the will's mastery over our natural animal instincts and keeps desires within the limits of what we call acceptable and honorable. Now remember, uh, don't get, again, too scrupulous because alcoholic consumption in moderation is not immoral, for example. But like most things, it becomes immoral when it's abused or overused. Um, okay, so now finally, St. Francis de Sales, one of my favorite saints, reminds us that it is not only our mouth <laughs> which has sinned, but also all of our other senses. So our fasting, this is awesome, must not just be limited to food in the mouth. I bet we don't think about that. If we have offended God through the eyes, for example, through the ears, through the tongue, and through our other senses, we should make them fast as well. You know, have you ever used your eyes to view something improper on the internet? Um, a great fast is to retain, uh, or should say, refrain from that. Have you gossiped with your tongue? A great fast is to stop speaking in that way. And not only must we do a fast of our bodily senses, but also of our soul, our soul's powers and passions. Yes, 
even of our understanding, our memories, and our will. Now, since we have sinned through both body and spirit, that's why we need to do this. You know, fast from recalling in your mind past sins of pleasure, for example, or current desires of hatred and revenge. You know, imagining getting back at somebody. Nobody is worth losing your soul. Satan can use our memories and imaginations like a VCR. Putting the tape in, rewind, play, rewind, play. It's awful. You know, playing these past sins of pleasure over and over, for example, causing us to want to commit them again. Or, or revenge, as I said. What we learned in Lent, for example, penance, should become the foundation of all of our spiritual life all year round. And spiritual fasting may be the best of all, which is simply giving up our will when it conflicts with God's will. You know, for example, um, such important decisions as stop using contraception. That's a big one. Or something as simple as letting your spouse order Chinese food when you really want Italian. Um, you know, in, in, in this, we will find ourselves truly stripped naked, like Jesus was on the cross. We cast off what is non-essential in order to get to what really matters. Then we will find God. This is what fasting really means. It is a paradox. Those who try to save their lives will lose it, but those who give up their lives will find it. You know, speaking of life and the tragedy of abortion, this is really what that paradox really is. Let us sit down now with Archbishop Cordy Leone of San Francisco, a great shepherd of the church, who um, sat down and talked with us about the importance of life and knowing the true meaning of God's teaching. Any comments on how we can keep the pro-life movement going, even though Roe v. Wade has technically been overturned? I hope they're not thinking that the battle's been won and now we can uh, sit back and relax. Um, exactly. We will, always, we will always have challenges in defending the sanctity of human life. Uh, they seem to be getting worse in the last, whatever, 50, 60 years. Uh, but there have always been challenges in defending the weak and the vulnerable. Uh, we have a great uh, victory here, but in some ways there are even greater challenges in states such as my own that are uh, seeking to, uh, that already have very liberal abortion laws to make them even more liberal, make it open wide access. So other states are moving in the opposite direction as if we're truly pro-life, we understand, and I'm grateful that there's been more and more awareness of this. What we need to do is support the women in the crisis pregnancy. So often yes. she feels alone, abandoned, isolated, afraid, and she shouldn't make a decision in a, a situation like that. She needs love and support. And yep. we know from uh, our crisis pregnancy clinics that when she's given that kind of love and support, all the information and support she needs to make an informed choice, they, they always opt for life. And you have been uh, an advocate in Texas, especially uh, for that hundred million dollar initiative to supply, yeah. um, you know, help for mothers, free diapers and care. Um, do you feel, though, the church itself, Archbishop, is doing enough? Uh, some of the states and charities are. But do you feel we as a church are doing enough? Uh, Texas is. I don't know if any other states are doing what Texas is doing. Good for point. the most part, only it's, it's only people of faith doing this. We are doing a lot. And I'm so grateful to, I'm proud of my fellow Catholics and other people of mainly Christian faith who are supporting these crisis pregnancy clinics. They're doing a lot. They're making great sacrifices without support from the government, uh, just wow. purely on their own. So we're doing a lot. So much needs to be done. So in a sense, you could say, no, it's not enough because there's so much that needs to be done but people are making great sacrifices to make these loving services available to women. So we need to keep doing that. Uh, that's why I was so happy to see what the state of Texas is doing to providing women. This is what is providing women real choice. Those yeah. who claim the badge of choice, they're really only interested in one choice. And what's happened since the Dobbs decision makes that clearer than ever. There can be no doubt that all they care about is one choice. They do not channel funds into 
these crisis pregnancy clinics that are giving women other choices uh, that she can make. They're, they're only really interested in one choice and one choice is no choice. Those of us in pastoral ministry have heard women say this. I didn't want to go through with it, but I felt like I had no choice. If we really had a culture of choice, abortion would be very rare. And your words uh, were you have said no Catholic in good conscience can favor abortion. Uh, you said right to choose is a smokescreen for perpetuating an entire industry that profits from one of the most heinous evils imaginable. Our land is soaked with the blood of the innocent and it must stop. And I, first of all, wanted to say thank you for using the powerful language that needs to be used because this is the heart of the lie that, well, this is my right. This is, this is reproductive right. This is freedom. And, uh, you know, one part of the aisle of Congress is saying that, that you were stripping the rights of women away. It's, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. The Dobbs decision actually restored a right. It didn't take a right away. Yeah. It restored the right to the people to decide what the abortion laws in their state will be. Now, it's, it's sad that not everyone would understand how evil it is, but at least it's the people who have a say in the matter and not um, nine unelected officials. Yeah. And, you know, we, we look back also to, uh, you know, people think, Archbishop, and, and you know this, that, well, the church wasn't always against abortion. This is something new. This is something that has just developed in recent years. And I'd like to quote again, uh, this is very powerful. Uh, I think you've pointed this out, uh, that first century letter of Barnabas, uh, which uh, you've pointed out, says, you shall not slay the child by procuring abortion. And this is first century. Um, Nor, again, shall you destroy life after it was born. And even the Second Vatican Council recently has, relatively recently has affirmed, life must be protected with the utmost care from the moment of conception. Abortion and infanticide are abominable crimes. That's from Gaudius et Spes, and, or Gaudium et Spes, and so, even Pope Francis declaring, um, you know, uh, abortion is homicide. So I'm wondering, where do you think people get this misconception that it's just a political recent issue? The opposite side does a really good job of getting a hold of the narrative and then uh, fooling people into thinking that's the true narrative. Uh, it's, it's so obvious from our history. The church has always been against killing innocent human life. Uh, th th there's been no abortion has always been uh, uh, an evil and a crime and a sin. It's, it's been very clear all throughout the history of the church. And I wanted to point that out in my pastoral letter. But the other side has this way of getting a hold of the narrative. And a lot of the way they do it is you mentioned about the smoke screen of choice. Uh, they, they manipulate the language and then they trick people into thinking in a different way. So notice how the language around this issue has evolved. Uh, originally, it was seen as way back on kind of a necessary evil, but women need to have that option in some cases. Then it became a matter of choice, uh, uh, the right to choose. Uh, then it's a matter of reproductive, of, of healthcare, and then now reproductive freedom. And notice they used to be shy to use the word abortion, but now they're using it openly. It's become now a positive good. They mm -hmm. embrace it as a good, and they're not shy to use that word, whereas they used to before. And this whole smokescreen of reproductive freedom that when a child is conceived, reproduction has happened. There's, there's, there's no freedom there because there is already reproduction. What you're talking yeah. about is, is killing the life that has been conceived. Uh, so we, and you know, we often fall into the trap. How often do people who are ardent advocates for life from conception to natural death use the label pro-choice in reference to people who believe abortion should be a right? As I like to say, we're all pro-choice. We all believe in the principle that people should have the right to make choices for their own lives. And we all believe, hopefully, that those, the right to choose has to be limited to the point where if it deprives another of their right, then it has to be limited at that point. Hopefully we all believe that. I would imagine that there are a lot of people who are pro-choice on the abortion issue or anti-choice on the school choice issue. So uh, we, we, but we 
uh, allow ourselves to fall into the trap. So we have to avoid this word game and say things for what they really are so we can get clarity on these issues. Yeah, in many ways, the uh, forced vaccination would be more about uh, my own body than would be uh, uh, abortion because now that's a different body affected. That's a different person. That's a different being. And um, so this is uh, a very important issue. All of a sudden, this other slogan, my body, my choice, somehow that didn't apply when it came to the choice to get vaccinated. Exactly. In fact, President Biden even said with regard to the vaccination mandate that there is no freedom, there is no choice, his exact words. Wow. And, you know, uh, I find it ironic, Archbishop, that they discovered bacteria on Mars and declared it as a sign of life. But yet a fetus in the yes. womb is not considered life. <laughs> so we, we have quite an irony. And finally, I know we're running out of time, Archbishop, but you know the church has launched a three-year national Eucharistic revival. And such at a needed time as belief in the real presence has dwindled, according to some studies. Um, how do you find that we can relate uh, the pro-life movement to the gift that God gives us in the Eucharist? How can, we, how can we connect those two most effectively, in your opinion? I really think it comes down to a sense of the sacred. We've lost a sense of the sacred, the sacredness of the Holy Eucharist. Uh, when we see there are so many examples of casual attitudes and way the Holy Eucharist is treated, it's not regarded with that sense of sacredness that it used to. We see how this spills over into sacredness of human life the sacredness of the bond of marriage. It was a, always considered a solemn vow, a sacred vow couples would make when they exchange vows on their, their wedding day. So it, it, it all, what it all is tied together with this loss of a sense of the sacred. That's what we have to recuperate. And that's what I'm hoping our Eucharistic re revival will help us to do when we reclaim that sense of the sacred, then we, will, we can appreciate that in other dimensions of life as well. Beautifully said, Archbishop. Again, thank you for your time and continue to keep up the good fight. We priests, uh, we rally around you and other bishops like yourself that are uh, first and foremost bringing us the beauty of the faith and the teaching as well as the defense of human life. Thank you and God bless you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Archbishop. It's always great to have a chance to talk with you. Now let's hear from Father Jim McCormick as he reads from Scripture about how to handle these disordered desires and temptations of the devil. Jesus thanks his Father. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At times, following the way of Christ can seem almost impossible. Loving our enemies or accepting persecution rather than moral compromise is certainly impossible apart from the help of divine grace. Here, Jesus promises that taking upon our shoulders the yoke of his teachings will actually be easy and light for us compared with trying to do things our own way. Choosing our own way only enslaves us to the false values of the world, the disordered desires of the flesh, and the temptations of the devil. By contrast, Christ himself will walk with us if we choose his way. He will help us bear his yoke and will mercifully grant us the rest and refreshment of heart we need to persevere. In the Blessed Sacrament, above all, we can find grace, comfort, and intimacy with Jesus to live as his true disciples. As St. Faustina writes, 
I find myself so weak that were it not for Holy Communion, I would fall continually. Jesus, concealed in the host, is everything to me. From the tabernacle I draw strength, power, courage, and light. Today, after Holy Communion, Jesus again gave me a few directives. First, do not fight against a temptation by yourself, but disclose it to the confessor at once, and then the temptation will lose all its force. Second, during these ordeals, do not lose your peace. Live in my presence. Ask my mother and the saints for help. Third, have the certitude that I am looking at you and supporting you. Fourth, do not fear either struggles of the soul or any temptations, because I am supporting you. If only you are willing to fight, know that the victory is always on your side. Fifth, know that by fighting bravely, you give me great glory and amass merits for yourself. Temptation gives you a chance to show me your fidelity. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us in the series of the seven deadly sins. And please be with us next week as we discuss one of the sins that is most pervasive in our Western culture, that of lust and the corresponding virtue of chastity. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.